Senator Hart, we hear a great deal of reporting from the site of the Three Mile Island nuclear event. Some of it seems contradictory, some of it is hard to understand. You're the chairman of the nuclear subcommittee. Can you tell us, do you believe that there is still a risk that before this is all over, before the entire incident is finished, there is a risk of a catastrophic accident? Yes, Mr. Herman, I do. I do. I do. The partial meltdown of Reactor 2 on Three Mile Island, it wasn't caused by an earthquake. And it wasn't a loss of power. It was caused by a design. And it wasn't the design of the reactor itself, it was the design of the reactor's interface. The interface, the way that the operators were meant to control the reactor, was an afterthought. Why the hell is that? Meet Robert Fabrican. I was designing things like this, remote controls. Co-founder of Dabo Design, former VP of Creative at Frog, who also worked on Cliff Kwan's critically acclaimed book, User-Friendly. Why would, of all things, the design of the controls for a massive nuclear reactor, both one of the most expensive and one of the most dangerous things that we're putting into our environment. Why would it be such an afterthought? Let's lay out what we mean. You have a massive reactor. It has a control room with 1,100 dials, 600 warning lights. In that environment, there are 14 different meanings for the color red on a light. There are 11 different meanings for the color green. There's no standardization of where a warning indicator and a switch, whether they're above or below each other, which are mapped to which. So you have this massive set of controls and information, and there isn't a logical pattern to it, not an apparent logical pattern. One more thing about the design of these control room systems that just kind of illustrates what an actor thought they were is because nuclear reactors were built in pairs, they also built the control rooms in pairs, but they made them mirror images of each other. So depending on which control room you went into, It was like reverse a world. And because of these deficiencies in design, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was convinced that an incident like Three Mile Island was inevitable. So the first question is, from where we stand today, why the hell is that? To explain that, we need to tell you a story about design, of how design became less about decoration and more about bridging the gap between technology and people. And that has to do with the user interface. GUI, that's graphics user interface. An interface controlled by someone's mind. It's a direct mind. Uh, vision interface. How's the user interface going to change? Interfaces are all around us. My bookshelf is full of interfaces. Each of these books is a way to interface with information, right? And in many ways, I consider the book to be the first and still one of the best, if not the best, interfaces ever created, right? Because there's content there, but around it are ways of interacting with it, are metadata about it, and some sort of way to start to organize how you relate to information and then ultimately to the world. Design is interface. It is the design of the interface between people and things. So what designers do is they give form to things that allow the connection between people and things. Meet Cameron Tonkinwise. We asked him to start this story about interfaces. On the one hand, I would go all the way back to artifact creation by homo faba, by humanoids in that way. They, they have always been doing interface design. On the other hand, I don't like to call that design because I think that limits our capacity to think about what is really particular about 20th century designing, uh, industrial revolution, operating at scale, mediating mass production with mass consumption, standardizing interfaces, making everybody use the same kind of devices in the name of cheapness, but also then profitability. So I think there's something particular about that modern version of interface. I'd give an example in the middle. When humans started manufacturing things that were dangerous, they started to realise that they needed to lie about them. It's a sad example of this lesson. The new London school, looking for a way to save money on heating, tapped into a natural gas line. Untreated natural gas is odorless and colourless, so no one detected the leak that filled the crawl space under the school. When their new consolidated grade and high school in the centre of the rich East Texas oil field was shattered by a terrific gas explosion, 
Had the blast occurred ten minutes later, school would have been dismissed. And the death toll small, perhaps. Over 300 students and teachers died. And as a result... The gas itself needed to be changed. You needed to lie about the gas and give it a smell. It didn't have a smell, and they were required to give it a smell so that if somebody walked into a room, they would sense that it was filled with this inert, this uh, um, ineffable, dangerous uh, substance. Once we start creating artificial environments, you need interface design to instruct people about those dangers. Take yourself back to World War II and imagine the late in World War II, there's a need for a very decisive victory by the Allies and a lot of new technology being rushed to the battlefield. Not just things like the bomb, but things like jets and radar and other technologies. And the tricky part is that there's not a great opportunity for people building these in the labs, given that, that urgency to really effectively test these solutions. It led to a lot of disasters and accidents. After the war, the government wanted to understand why. They brought in an experimental psychologist named Paul Fitz, and he was really just given a pile of data, reports, and asked to look into it. And the assumption was the way it had all been classified was with a term called pilot error, basically person making a mistake. And the interesting thing for Paul Fitz when he looked at it is he figured if it was human error that the pattern would be very scattershot. But he found that the same things were happening over and over again. And working with a colleague named Alphonse Chapanis, they started to refer to it not as pilot error, but as design error. And a classic example that we document in the book is on these big B-17 bombers, these flank fortresses. The physical toggle you use to initiate the landing gear is physically identical to the same toggle you use to activate the wing flaps, which would do the opposite. Landing gear coming down, wing flaps going up. And they're right next to each other. According to their analysis, this flaw alone led to four, over 450 crashes in 22 months in the Pacific Theater. The great thing about these guys is even though they're psychologists, they took it to the next step. And Alphonse Chapanis in particular, what he developed had a few components to it. The most famous is something we refer to as shape coding. So the shape of the wing flap control is shaped like a, flank, a wing flap. The landing gear is literally a small round wheel so that you can reach them and physically immediately distinguish between the two, even though they're part of the same kind of control cluster. Any successful interface means that somebody is able to fuse themselves with a design, with an artifact, with a, with, with a product, with a service. They're able to actually uh, make that a prosthetic, make it part of who they are, which means that when you design an interface, you're actually also designing people. You are designing people to approach whatever they're doing in a particular way. And this brings us to what went wrong at Three Mile Island. If you pull back, the story of Three Mile Island takes you one step beyond just individual patrols and individual usability issues. It was the last thing that was built. And often the projects were running way over budget and timelines, set regulations for many good reasons. So there was a rush to finish these cockpits, these, these control rooms. The second is that people who are engineering and building these things had such faith in all the safeguards and all the redundancy and backup systems that they were operating under the assumption that in the ideal world, the people were, were super, almost superfluous. Specifically, a single gauge was misread. And the problem with that gauge is it was meant to show whether the cooling tower had opened to release some of the temperature and pressure. But all the light indicated was that the switch to make that happen had been thrown. The light didn't indicate whether that had actually happened. How people interpreted it is what drove their response. And the meltdown was caused by the response. The system actually left alone would have not had a full meltdown. It would have flooded and the core would not have been lost. The psychological space we need to navigate is not just about individual switches and how they're mapped and their logic. But it's the bigger idea of, of how we form a mental model of how something works. Somebody has to do that translation and designers are that translator of things to humans and humans to things. Don Norman pioneered this style of thinking, giving a new vocabulary to how designed objects speak to users. Like an object affordances, are all the things that an object affords you to do with it. All the artifacts are telling you what they can do through their design form. 
they are all trying to speak in that way. And the art of interface design is the art of getting things speaking. Recognize that behind that conversation isn't some master field of like mathematical physics and science. It's designers making choices. And even the biggest companies reaching us with the biggest platforms in the world, there is still a lot of qualitative decision-making going into how things turn out the way they did. In some cases, in some organizations, they have the opportunity to be well-informed because they have the space to do the user research, the prototyping, the iteration, all that stuff. In some cases, they don't have that opportunity, but they're designing for someone very much like themselves, right? You know? Um, and then in other cases, like, it's completely off the rails. Engagement with people before, during, and after, and the after is the absolutely missing one here. Those need to be moments that are given time. That's an investment. It doesn't take a lot of money, except paying people to spend the time to do it. So actually coming to understand people and not a set of people, but particular people. Really trying to understand where they find value, what gives them a sense of dignity and autonomy, uh, what it is that they need, not in a sort of instrumental sense, but in the sense of feeling fulfilled as humans. That's the most important thing designers need to be doing, is just spending time with people uh, and, and listening. And listening and learning to talk in such a way that you can draw out what you need to listen for. When you're doing user testing, you are not testing the thing. You are testing people. So a user test is a test of the user and how difficult you've made life for them and how it is that you could change the thing to make things better for them. Which means you don't just get them to do it and possibly think aloud and eye track them and, you know, or measure, do an A-B test. It means really talking to people about their experience of that interface uh, and designing with them at that moment. User testing is a great moment at which to do co-design uh, because you brought ideas and they will have experiences. You might have thought they were going to get value out of it this way, but instead they're starting to get value out of it that way. And, and I know no business leader will want to hear this, but uh, the only source of value is spending time with people. If you want to hear more from experts in design, research, and product development, you should subscribe to Outlier. Outlier by Dovetail is where we publish stories from experts like Teresa Torres, Marty Cajun, and many more. My personal favourite is this article, A Teardown of Modern Car Design, by Hamish Henderson. It's a great read. Just head to dovetail.com slash outlier to subscribe. And to wrap up, we asked Cameron to tell us if there's any products that he loves. I tend to be mostly grumpy, so I tend to mind. like one of the things about things that work well is when they work well, uh, you don't notice them. And they have that quietness and they, they feel part of you. So it's often difficult to, it's really difficult to do user research this way because you ask somebody and, and like I'm stumbling now, you can't say what does well. I have, you know, one example, just a really lame example, but it, it it was just novel. I bought a pair of secateurs. It affords careful interaction with the plants that I'm growing. But this one that I've got, the bottom handle has a rotation capacity in it. So as you squeeze, it rolls in your hand. And it came from somebody realizing that if you just have regular secateurs that don't have this rolling bottom interface you get a blister after a while it's such a sort of polite interaction design it's it's such a minor gesture of care it it just it's one of those things whenever i see something like that i just think like i love humans i hate humans at the moment they're just like terrible they're doing terrible things to each other all over the place but i love humans particularly designers because somebody somewhere who does not know me, someone somewhere anticipated me getting this blister and just thought that is a tiny problem that can be solved. It's a very simple way to solve it. It's not a complicated mechanism. I'm just gonna have the kind of sleeve of this thing that can rotate. And so you, you just, like it's one of those things where you just suddenly think, 
the world can be full of careful things, things that are full of care, that just say someone somewhere used their creativity to anticipate this tiny pain of getting a blister as you cut the secateurs. Uh, and so, yeah, I love that. 